schoolhouses in Tippecanoe County from 1865 to 1873, and she'll also update us on the refurbishing of the Morris Schoolhouse in the new Cason Family Park on Cumberland Avenue. What a wonderful community we live in where um, you know, people donate land for, for all of this. It's just, just a great thing. So, um, and then to assist me in the introduction of Sue Eiler is her, one of her best friends, um, Jan Fall. Oh my goodness. You, you need a guest introducer to introduce the guest speaker. Um, Sue and I have been friends for 57 years, which of course means that we knew each other before we were born. There you go. Um, I could tell you many, many stories about Sue. Um, when I come to town, they graciously open their home, and I'm kind of the upstairs rodent that lives, uh, lives upstairs at their house. And so I've been really blessed with, with their friendship over the years, and there's lots of other stories I could tell, but let's see what Sue told Gail to say. Um, socially active Sue Eiler recently retired after 28 years as a clinical social worker with Purdue's Counseling and Psychological Services. Sue continues to lend a compassionate hand by serving on the board of directors for the West Lafayette Parks and Recreation Foundation Board and took the lead in organizing a committee to save the Old Morris School. Built in 1879 and located on the corner of US 231 and Cumberland Avenue, Sue's passion for this project began when she read a journal that a school examiner had carried in his saddlebag as he traveled to examine one-room schoolhouses in Tippecanoe County. Two of her favorite quotes from the journal were, diff were difficult to hear the children recite due to the hogs under the schoolhouse, <laughs> and arrived at the schoolhouse, it had burned down. <laughs> Thanks to Sue's efforts and those of historians, teachers, park, st park staff, construct construction folk, and Mr. Lynn Kaysen's donation of 14 acres, a schoolhouse will soon be moved, it has been moved, to its new home in the Kaysen Family Park. So without any further ado, I am pleased to turn this over to Sue Eiler and her handy technology um, guy that travels with her. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. This has been a really fun journey. Um, my paper is composed of two pieces. One, this journal that we'll talk about the, the school. Keep, keep the mic closer. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and wave if it's not loud enough. That the school examiner carried in his saddlebags on the back of his horse between 1865 and 1873. And then the last few minutes we'll be updating you on what's happening with the Morris Schoolhouse. Um, I'm glad I enjoy talking about it. So go with me, if you will, to April 10th, 1865. Lafayette celebrated the Union victory in the Civil War with fireworks, music, cheering, singing on the Columbia Street side of the courthouse. May 1st, 1865, about 1 p.m., <coughs> President Lincoln's funeral train passed to Lafayette at five miles an hour and went to Chicago, then Springfield, Illinois, for the burial of Lincoln's remains. June 16th of that same year, the Reverend C.P. Jennings took the oath of office and became the school examiner for Tippecanoe County. Mr. Jennings had two main responsibilities, which were to one, examine potential teacher candidates, and upon passing the exam, provide them their license. Two was to visit the one-room schoolhouses in Tippecanoe County and make notes about the status of the facilities and the teaching therein. The extra gentleman you'll see in some of these photos may well have been the school examiner. On this same date, Mr. Jennings purchased a journal, deeming it necessary and a duty to keep a journal of the proceedings of the examiner. This journal that he carried in the saddlebags on his horse is kept at the Tippecanoe County Historical Society. This afternoon, I will give you just a window to look back 152 years ago to the one-room schoolhouses in Tippecanoe County. How many one-room schoolhouses do you imagine there were in Tippecanoe County before the turn of the century? How many? Make a guess. Yes. How many schoolhouses do you imagine? Three? Five. Twenty? How many? Another guess? Who say 50? I'll say 55. A hundred and eight. Here's our map of Tippecanoe County, and the red circles highlight the one room schoolhouse. At the time of this journal, there were very few photos of schoolhouses that existed. So most of the photos you're going to see in the next 15 minutes um, 
were made 15 to 20 years after this uh, journal was written. So not, the pictures are not always going to match up for the, with what I'm saying because of the fact that there weren't really photos from the era in which the journal was written. Mr. Jennings carried a variety of papers in his saddlebags to assist in examining and licensing new teachers. But he also carried 14 pieces of something called fool's cap paper. Does anyone know what fool's cap paper might have been used for? I used to. Yes, any guesses? It's very interesting. Fool's cap paper is a thick, waxy paper that was used to repair broken windows. Oh. Hmm. This afternoon, I will talk, share entries from the journal about discipline, the weather, and school conditions. I also looked at the Lafayette School Board minutes during the same time, and you might find it interesting to note that the trustees of the common schools of the city of Lafayette included John Perdue. The city schools were more advanced, and they were already under a school superintendent, whereas the county schools during this time were dependent on the largesse of the township trustee and whatever he was willing to give to the schoolhouse. Discipline was an issue that the good Reverend Jennings commented on frequently in his, as he visited schools in Tippecanoe County. His first observation on November 28th of 1865 was 70 pupils under care, a good degree of order preserved. He notes at one school how the pupils bow as they retire at the close of school but at another school, he notes, a boy expelled for quarreling and profanity. Tardiness seemed to be a problem as well. Sheffield School opened at 8.30 in the morning without any devotional exercises. Pupils continued to come in until 10 a.m. They entered as though tardiness was an ordinary occurrence. In Wea Township, Miss McCormick expelled one young man considered very troublesome. He was 22. She, the teacher, was about 18 or 20. Well done. No fence and the house stands at the edge of the forest. But it gets worse. The minutes of the Lafayette School Corporation at the same time noted Master Eddie Cunningham appeared before the school board, or school board guy, appeared before the school board having been twice suspended for bad conduct. His last offense was, you'll like this, making obscene pictures on his slate and exhibiting them to other scholars. <laughs> one, one teacher had found his own way of dealing with such problems. In Sheffield Township Pasteboard School, Mr. Sims, the teacher, quote, seemed to be well supplied with quips in his schoolroom, saw several lying around the recitation seats. The teacher frequently walking around the room with a switch some four or five feet in length. Order poor, much rushing to and from the recitation seats. We can kind of understand why the children were rushing to get to their seats, can't we? At Elston School, called Red Eye, the teacher said, when introducing the school examiner, young ladies and young gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing. Weather was also a big issue discussed in the school examiner's journal. He was very aware of the cold Indiana weather. On December 27, in school, he notes, on a very cold morning, visited Bennett School in Union Township. Scholars, small, house, large and cold. Stove, small and very hot. No maps or charts on the walls, but a good many cobwebs. In January 1866, a young lady presented herself for examination with a statement that on account of the intense cold on January 29th, she couldn't come as her home was 15 miles distant. She presented a paper signed by several in her district in which it stated if she weren't licensed, there could not have a school this season and they entreated that she be allowed to be examined. In the presence of her father, I gave her a license. It being an extreme case, it's not supposed that the law intends a district shall be deprived of a school in an extreme case. Several notations talked about the cold weather and the hardships it presented. Mount Tom School, the house situated on the open prairie, no shade trees or blackboards, weather very cold. January 2, started to go into the county to visit school but found the road so icy that I could not proceed and consequently stopped by the way and had my horse shod. 
you all are going to love this side story. I told that story to the Journal and Courier reporter on the day we <coughs> ate from Morris Schoolhouse, that, the, that he had stopped and had his horse shod. She put it in the Journal and Courier. I stopped and had my horse shot. <laughs> it was clear this young lady was not familiar with the term shot. But I feel safe using that word in here today. Other weather-related events also impacted school, as noted on December 13. School not in session for the day, as the teacher is engaged in butchering. <laughs> what was mentioned the most was the danger of hot stoves in small schools on very cold days. Frog pond school. The teacher tells me the stove has fallen once or twice and is at present in danger of burning the house. Teacher complains that the trustee is careless and indifferent in regard to providing necessary fuel for the schoolhouse. Mr. Jennings notes, went to Wyandotte school. The teacher had just, admit, just dismissed on account of the house taking fire. <laughs> One of the most interesting descriptions written in the journal is Clapper School. I'll read it as it describes it. This house is built of, built of logs that closely fitted together. At one time, the interslices between the logs were filled with mud, <coughs> but time and winds have overcome its adhesiveness, and the house is now a self-ventilating concern. <laughs> Although these stories sound harsh, one story I learned occurred in Nebraska at the same time frame, 1988. Following a relatively warm January day, children arrived at school without their warmest clothes. The blizzard arrived midday, and the teachers didn't know whether to keep the children at schools with inadequate fuel or food, or send them home in the blizzard. Miss Minnie Freeman reported that when the roof blew off the schoolhouse, she tied the children to a rope and they all made it safely to her boarding house about a mile away. But many children and many teachers were not so fortunate and died in that blizzard. The school examiner also talks about buildings, books, and apparatus. Many of the entries describe the upkeep of the buildings. March 19th, Fairfield Township, number six. Room very dirty and window sash thick with dust. Most of the pupils are idle and restless. Air very bad from neglect of ventilation. The gates off its hinges and line in the mud. Very muddy at the door. Governed by stern <coughs> command, Mr. Smith gives his pupils high character. At Frog Pound School, now the roads are wet and the meadow, now the roads, now the roads and wet meadows interfere with attendance, so it numbers only 15 to 18 pupils. The floor is littered, the air is bad, the walls are marked and defaced. Children, for the most part, idle and talking when the teacher's back is turned. Stewart School in Randolph Township. House is well supplied with maps and charts, but the floor is open in places, administering draughts of air. In the afternoon, I took the train and came to Lafayette. Mr. Oglesby, the trustee, could not find the time to accompany me to the school visits. His business prevents him from giving proper attention to the schools. Wabash Township number nine, Jacob Temple School. The outhouse is in a dilapidated condition. The lightning rod is broken and on the ground. I was really impacted by the comments made about the desperately poor lighting and ventilation in the schoolrooms. December 29, and we can all picture how dark a day could be in December 29. Called attention to the trustee, to the school, and the darkness in the schoolrooms is complained of by pupils and teachers alike. It is unfavorable to the health and the eyes of the teachers and pupils. Unusual noises were also a part of the schools on the prairie. As Jan mentioned, my favorite entry in the whole journal is, let's see, exercises in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and spelling, pretty good, was, discur was disturbed by the squealing of the pigs under the house. <laughs> it being open beneath, the pigs use it as a place of refuge in bad weather. On November 16, 1868, um, much is reported, much noise, many of the pupils passing about the house, going out the door constantly, and to the water pail to drink. On August 25th, Mr. Jennings notes, the township trustees met at 11 a.m. in my office. We decided the rate of compensation for teachers this season shall be $40 a month. They adopted the following textbooks. 
McGuffey, Speller and Reader, Felter's Arithmetic, Panot's English Grammar, Davies' Algebra, and they resolved that there would be no changes for six years. <laughs> Visited the schoolhouse in Chauncey, Miss Lizzie Colecraft, the teacher, 48 present. Order was poor, whispering with considerable confusion. Went to Weout Township in Green Hill, 45 pupils crowded into a small room, no chairs, school furniture scanty. There was mention of a new schoolhouse, this is a different one, um, with, with seats that lift at pleasure. Do you know what I'm talking about, right? The old schoolhouse seats where the seat folded up uh, as they rode, were together. Laramie Township in Little Brown School. It is imperative to persuade the parents to furnish slates and thus have smaller scholars write and print their lessons on slates. Here in Wabash Township, we had Wabash number two, known as the Roundhouse. This was a schoolhouse that was built in the form of an octagon. Again, not that one, but in the minutes. He talks some about teachers. As has always been the case, teachers had a lot to deal with. And Oakland School, Mr. Orb, the teacher, had 100 pupils, grades 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, all under one teacher. He is able to hear but one recitation from them each day. I love this photo. This is a photo of the Lafayette School teachers. Southern School, another school, grades had 9 and 10. Miss Mendel was the teacher. She had 108 pupils under her care. Too many. She has them under tolerable control. At Central School, a city school, it's noted that grades 7 and 8 had opening exercises consisting of some verses read from the New Testament, the Lord's Prayer, and the singing of some verses of morning hymns. In the School Examiner's Journal, there were also excerpts regarding what he calls the Colored School. Visited the Colored School in Lafayette, taught by W.I. Gifford, 20 enrolled and 18 present. The monthly examination was in progress. The answers were generally correct. In the evening, he visited the Knight Colored School, taught by Mr. Taylor. There were 20 pupils present, mostly adults, all giving closest attention to their work. In October 1872, in Cartmill School, he notes, the teacher's language is above the comprehension of the students. He possesses very little skill in teaching, and the house is used in the summer for drying wheat. Hmm. The window on the eight years of the county school examiner came to a close in 1872. At the conclusion of this journal, it states, the office of the school examiner ceases to exist in virtue of an act of legislation naming Mr. J. E. Matthews the first superintendent of the Tippecanoe County Schools. So, oh, I add this picture at the end. This is the number 10 schoolhouse, the Grange that many of you are familiar with at the corner of Lindbergh and 400. Uh, we don't have the names of the students, but I think it's a, a marvelous picture. Um, Jan and I have a friend, the, the workman grandparents are in those kids, or some of those kids are uh, grandparents of um, co uh, kids that Jan and I went to school with. This is Morris Schoolhouse. Uh, I should tell you, some of you may be familiar. Twelve years ago, when I first got interested in this, I interviewed a woman named Georgia Foster, a dear woman who lived at, did you know her? Yes. Well, I so wish I had gone back and interviewed her more. She attended Morris School from first to third grade. She explained that the boys' cloakroom was on the right and the girls' cloakroom was on the left, and the fact that the boys had to walk across the road to get to the pump to get water for the classroom. Her second story isn't about Morris School, but I'm going to tell you because it's such a fascinating story, she told me. She lived in a big farmhouse on 52. Her mother would give she and her sister a nickel and they would walk to the celery bar. They would knock on the shanty door, and the folks would come out and put on their wooden shoes and cut celery for the girls to take home. Oh, I know, such a great story. Georgia explained that she stopped going to Morris School in third grade when the new Morton School was opened, and her father would take them to school in a buggy. So when I saw that the Franciscans were planning to build on the spot where this old schoolhouse stood, I went straight away to the mayor's office. And soon we had a remarkable committee of architects, historians, builders, 
and interested citizens working together to try to figure out how to save Morris School. The person that made that all possible is Mr. Lynn Kaysen. He and his wife, Carolyn, are not in town this week. He made a contribution of 13.6 acres of land for a new park that will showcase the schoolhouse where Mr. Kaysen's parents attended school. It will be known as Kaysen Family Park. So uh, if you think about how to find the schoolhouse, you simply go out of the West Lafayette Walmart, and instead of turning right to Northwestern, you're going to turn left on that new stretch of Cumberland, and the schoolhouse is um, uh, on the hill. Here are photos of the schoolhouse field trip day. It was amazingly smooth to watch these experts move the schoolhouse 900 feet in about two hours. The guy driving the whole thing walked behind it and used a little handheld remote control. The, older, the other man was moving thin sheets of steel from behind the back wheels to the front to make a smooth access across the field. Uh, let me catch up with you there, Ed. It was an exciting day. We had the mayor, school children, and West Lafayette Park officials present. This picture is Sally Watlington, our mayor, John Dennis, uh, Jan Foley, the park superintendent, and Lisa Decker from the Franciscan Alliance folks. Um, and this is, are some of the fourth graders that came out. One of the plans we have for the school is that all fourth grade children in Indiana are required to have hands-on history experience. Um, a school that has been refurbished sim similar to this in Indianapolis has 70 scheduled school trips coming in this year. So we will be having, we have someone on our committee who's very eager to be a schoolmaster, uh, and he will be in costume. And we have identified that although the school was built in 79 and closed in 1916, we're probably going to narrow in on 1882. We'll talk about who was the president, what was going on politically in the world at that point, uh, and the children have the experience. We're hoping to have a uh, pump out in front of the schoolhouse that kids can pump. We have uh, been given a beautiful old <coughs> belly stove from Indianapolis. We've been given a wonderful old teacher's, uh, master, uh, teacher, master teacher's desk for the front of the schoolroom. Um, we're collecting old school desks, the kind that collapse of the, during this same time period. I have one in my attic, several others have been donated. If you know people who have them as plant stands and are ready to share them in a permanent way where they'll be valued and taken care of, um, please let me know. John Collier did a um, conceptual park plan design for us. Um, it, we're waiting for, it will be another six months before we have actually Indianapolis designers who will give us a bid on what the park, who will do the park <coughs> designing. Um, but this gives you some sense. It's a long, narrow park. The Franciscan Alliance facility, whether it's an urgent care or hospital, we don't know, will be to the left, and then there will be farmland to the right. But the schoolhouse will certainly be front and center. The really fun thing is we are to the point where Fieldstone has put, been put around the base. A front, a, a restored front door is being fabricated by Henry Poor. Um, we have ordered the windows. Uh, they'll be put in in January or February. Uh, there's a woodworking group, maybe some of you here participate, but there's a marvelous woodworking group in the town that has offered to refurbish all the desks for us. Mm. Let me look and see. I got off my notes, but I think we've covered everyone. Um, well, this is an important piece. So there's one piece left. We've had wonderful grants from the Community Foundation, from um, Dr. Art Aronson, from... Um, can't remember all the places where the grants have come from. But we're still about $30,000 short of finishing the refurbishing of the schoolhouse. Uh, we'll be continuing to request grants. But one way that you can have a piece in it that will last for generations to come is the schoolhouse is um, going to, it's a red brick schoolhouse, and it's going to have a red brick path going up to the entrance of the schoolhouse, a handicap accessible path. Um, if you are interested, you can have uh, your favorite school teacher, your mother if she was a school teacher, someone who attended one room schoolhouses, or your grandchildren's names engraved on a brick. And that brick will be there long after we're gone. So I have some forms with me. I'll try to scurry to the back, kind of stand at the door for anyone. I don't have enough for everyone, but if you think you might be interested, the cost of a brick is $200. 
It's an investment in the future. But for $200, you can have three lines. You can get, oh, five or six grandkids' names on one brick if you're interested. Or maybe you want to honor someone that you know who's been important in education and made a difference with education and uh, honor them by having a brick. So I think I have covered everything, but one of the most fun parts of a presentation like this is hearing a few comments. And I don't, I don't know how much time we have left, but I always hear great stories from, from you all. And it sounds like you have a story to share. Well, it's not a story, but I have textbooks that fall in that range between 1879 to 1917, and I would love to give those if you if there is a place for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I we are receiving some already. Um, I come up afterwards and we'll share email information. Okay. Uh, it's probably a little early, but if somebody's cleaning out and says I need to get rid of these now, we'll be happy to have them. Some of the we'd like to have some books that the children can actually turn pages of and look at these old books. Then we also recognize we'll have some precious books that should not be touched. So there will be some glass cabinet <laughs> there that we'll, we'll be keeping some documents that uh, won't be accessible. But we'd like it to be, it's, it's not going to be a museum. It's going to be a refurbished schoolhouse that children can play in and learn in. Um, so yes, thank you for your offer. Yeah. I'm sometimes driving around the, 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 the town or in the county, I, I see houses, I often say, I bet you that was a schoolhouse. But how many are left in Pippinville County? I, I don't know how many of are left, but if you're driving up Grant Street and you make the left on Salisbury, I think in my mind there's a White House on the corner, yeah. and right behind that house is one that has sort of a flat roof, and either that part of that was a, a one room schoolhouse, and it's yeah, just because I was a realtor, I knew that from a long time ago. Yeah. They're, they're, they're everywhere. There's yeah. several. The question you're asking is very interesting. We don't know. Many of them have been turned into homes. Many have been torn down. Um, it will be interesting someday. Maybe we can get a scholar who will kind of look at the county and gather that data for us, but we don't know. Sam? Yes. When I was 18 years old, I taught on Hickory Knob, West Virginia, in a one-room school, had 15 students in all eight grades. Oh, That's marvelous. That's really wonderful. And do you share with a larger group, Sam, uh, what birthday you had? What birthday? Oh. How, how old you are? They know, I think. I'm 99. I'm 99. Mm -hmm. yoo -hoo. I know. It's just amazing. They, they know. Yes? I noticed uh, a lot of your references was to December the 28th or the 29th. When did uh, Christmas breaks come in? How huh. break? That's such a good question. One of the things I didn't cover in this was they talk in the journal about this new thing called Teachers Institute where the teachers go for training. One year, the Teachers Institute was held on December 24th, 25th, and 26th. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, Christmas was not the big deal that it is now. Uh, they did talk about that night. There, were some, there was a service that you could attend, I think, at St. John's Episcopal Church. I think that was one of the churches that was standing. But you hear nothing about holidays in reading the notes that I'm familiar with. Yes. Where the building is located now, is that where it's going to firmly stay? Yes, it has been moved to Move its new place. solid location, and they're going to be grading it in the next few weeks, and then windows and doors will be the next step. Then probably spring is when more interior refurbishment will start. All right. Thank you. with this $200 brick, uh, I have a form for you. It's easy to fill out, and uh, I'll take them and stand by the door and get to say hello to everyone.